conference uh, uh, 2016 seminars of the Research Center for Innovation in Learning Technologies at the Open University of Israel. We are honored to have here today with us Professor Alan um, Evner from the MoMA College of Business, University of South Florida. Uh, Professor Evner will be deliver the opening keynote at, of the second uh, day of the 11th Chess Conference for the Study of Innovation and Learning Technologies, uh, which will be held tomorrow, Tuesday, February 16, and Wednesday, February 17, at the Open University of uh, Israel camp campus in Ranana. Chase Conference is the major annual, annual event of Israeli researchers of innovation and learning technologies, and it draws more than 500 participants, both academics and uh, practitioners. On behalf of the Research Center for Innovation in Learning Technologies, I would like to thank Professor Evner uh, for agreeing to conduct this pre-conference seminar. Alan Evner is eminent uh, scholar and professor in the information systems and design uh, and decision uh, uh, science de uh, department at the MoMA College of Business at the University of South Florida. He holds the city group Eden River Chair of Distributed uh, Technology. Dr. Evner's areas of uh, research in, uh, include design science research, information systems development, software engineering, distributed database systems, healthcare systems, and service-oriented computing. Dr. Evner received a PhD in computer science uh, from the um, University of, uh, from the Purdue University. Dr. Evner is a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science and a fellow of the Association for Information Systems, as well as being awarded numerous uh, additional honors. His 2004 MIS quarterly uh, paper, Design Science in Information Systems Research, has been cited over 7,000 times according to Google Scholar and serves as a major facilitator for, of advancing design science research. I'm delighted to invite Professor Alan Ivner to de deliver the seminar titled Effective Design Science Research. Alan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for that very uh, generous introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation uh, to be part of uh, the Chase uh, uh, conference, as well as this opportunity to uh, present some ideas on design science to uh, a smaller select group. Uh, so I w first I want to make sure everybody can see the screen OK. Uh, definitely uh, left-handed facing the screen. So if you <laughs> need to move that way, please, uh, please do so. I'll try not to uh, get in your way. Uh, so let me uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the objective of this uh, seminar today. Um, I've presented this material a lot of times, uh, but I want to uh, essentially customize every presentation, and in particular this seminar, because I understand that not everybody comes from the information systems uh, field here. And, um, you know, I really want to address your questions and uh, how you anticipate using design science in your research projects. So uh, I presented this to many different uh, disciplines and audiences, um, you know, from uh, undergraduates all the way through doctoral students. In fact, uh, doctoral symposiums have sort of been my specialty, if you will, because I presented this uh, in probably 15, 20 doctoral uh, symposiums because I really think it's important for doctoral students, young faculty, and experienced faculty to understand the goals of design uh, because not all of us do the type of design research. But I think one of my objectives is for no matter what type of research you do, to think about how design impacts uh, you know, your thinking in you know, whatever type of research, whether it's behavioral research, economic research, 
there is a design thinking that goes on in any good research project, in my opinion. So with that in mind, uh, I can move through these slides as fast or as slow as, uh, as you would like. Uh, so let me customize what I'm saying here today to uh, you know, what you would like to get out of this uh, seminar. Uh, basically, I'll cover very quickly the 2004 paper, uh, see if there are any questions there, then move into uh, the paper that Shirley Greger and I just presented uh, in uh, 2013, go through some of those ideas, and then I have other extensions of design science research we can get into uh, that I think are very exciting. But if we don't get to those, that's, that's fine. Uh, Let's see how far we go. So what is design science research? Well, uh, we draw from the fundamental contributions of Herbert Simon uh, at Carnegie Mellon. He, uh, in the 60s and 70s, came up with some thinking on what is the science of the artificial. Uh, he felt that we needed to define what is a problem-solving paradigm such that we as humans have a creative uh, aspiration to solve problems, and we create new ideas, new artifacts to solve these problems. Now, this isn't to say the ideas, you know, just originated in the uh, 20th century. Uh, clearly, design in all of our, all the disciplines have been around for millennium. I mean, the earliest ideas of building aqueducts and engineering, education architecture and art had definite elements of design. So the question is, how is design research? You know, where, if we just come up with good ideas, how do we demonstrate, how do we provide evidence that that design is new, is interesting, in some way advances human knowledge? And this is the challenge that we face here. So some of the, the original papers, uh, and I include Shirley and David Jones's paper there, uh, uh, some of the initial thinking it, in the IS field now. Uh, but again, I want you to think about how this applies to your disciplines. <clears throat> Just a little history on that uh, 2004 paper. Um, the impetus for why we wrote that was there was a, a group of us in the more technical areas of uh, information systems. We were building algorithms, we were building logical models of database systems, and we felt that we, if not excluded, we were not part of the mainstream of the traditional IS discipline. So uh, we broke off, uh, I won't say we broke off, but we formed sort of our own little group, uh, the WITS community, and we drew from uh, a, a lot of sources here. You see, through the 90s, people were thinking about, you know, how do we bring more technical thinking into the IS field, including Jay Nunnemaker's group, uh, Johanny Ivera in, in Finland, um, Stu Madnick at MIT, and so as we brought this together, it came to the attention of the leaders of the IS field, people like Gordon Davis and uh, Bob Zamud and, and other people, and Ron Weber, who felt that we needed to establish, we needed to put some stakes in the ground as to what it meant to do design science research. Uh, so Alan Lee, who was the editor-in-chief at that point, came to a group of us, myself, uh, Sal March, Suda Ram, um, and said, why don't you put together a paper and let's figure out how we can define this field for the rest of the community. Well, it took us six years and four review cycles, <laughs> so it wasn't an easy task. Uh, and I have to think Alan uh, probably threw out a half dozen uh, reviews he got on that paper saying, okay, you know, we're, we're not going to try to solve or satisfy everybody here. We want to put together something that uh, people can debate about going forward, but it has to be established. So just quickly, let me, uh, let me work through some of the basic ideas <clears throat> of, that, of that paper. Uh, and again, it comes from an information systems sort of perspective where systems are composed of people, 
structures, technologies, and work systems. So it all isn't just software. Uh, it all isn't just data. We want to try to understand the socio-technical aspects of systems, which is what our field is about. And it was dominated uh, primarily by what we would term trying to find the truth, trying to understand uh, the behaviors that resonated and were used in those type of systems. But we felt that there was another clear, important aspect of doing information systems research, and that is building new things, coming up with useful artifacts that we could put into play in these organizational, human-based contexts. And one of the ways of thinking about that was just this iteration cycle. The fact that as we do good behavioral research and try to understand how the world works, and we would develop theories that provided truth, then we would also want to take those truths, how the world works, to develop better ways of performing and new artifacts. Uh, which would then provide utility and allow us to then extend our understanding of new theories that are embedded around those new technologies. So this is really a self-perpetuating, mutually beneficial cycle of doing good design research and good behavioral research. So we get to the whole idea of what is design. What is design thinking? By the way, that's a popular term these days. A lot of people talk about design thinking uh, uh, as a, if you will, strategy for uh, organizational uh, development and advancement. But the interesting thinking thing about design is that it is clearly an overused uh, uh, term here. It's both a noun, what is the design that you're developing, and in our paper we define four basic types of design, constructs, models, methods, and instantiations. We can discuss that a little more as you think about how that applies to, to your field. Second, design is a verb. We do design. So again, in our context, we talk about two activities here. We build something in a creative way. We build something that hasn't existed in the world before but then we also evaluate it. We try to understand why it provides a better way of doing in the world. Okay, so it's, it's an evidence-based type of research also. The other really interesting thing here is that design solves wicked problems. And this comes out of the engineering field and other fields. What is a wicked problem? Well, it's a problem that is complex, it's unstable, it evolves over time, it has complex interactions among its subcomponents. If you can break it down into uh, component-based uh, thinking. But we also have the capability of solving it with flexible um, uh, components. We have malleable components to solve these problems particularly when we're talking about hardware, software, what makes up an in information systems, including the human component. So we have ability to uh, be flexible as we change these artifacts and the processes that we design to use those artifacts. The other thing, of course, design is dependent upon human creativity, which, as we know, is not very well defined, <laughs> makes it a wicked type of problem. But it is also dependent upon our social abilities here to work together as teams, to have interdisciplinary um, abilities to bring together different perspectives, different think ways of thinking, different ideas. So design is a noun, design is a verb, design attempts to solve wicked problems real world. This is the, probably the major figure out of the uh, 2004 paper. Um, and I'm going to assume a little bit of familiarity here with it, but I'll quickly go over the aspect of relevance. 
where we're dealing with real world problems, business needs, but also issues of education, uh, uh, art, architecture, real problems, wicked problems. We also draw our rigor from the existing knowledge base. And this knowledge base has you know, existing behavioral theories in it, it has our instruments, it has existing artifacts, constructs, models, methods, instantiations, and it has the methodologies that we use for experimentation, for building, for uh, evaluating here. So as we draw the relevance and the rigor, then we do the design science research uh, in the center here, build and evaluate with a rapid loop between those two. So as we build something, we're almost simultaneously thinking about how do, would we evaluate it. And as we refine then the artifact that we want to put into the field, then we make two types of contributions. We contribute the artifact itself into the real world uh, opportunity and context. And we also make a contribution to the knowledge base from what we've learned from doing the building and the evaluating, okay, which would lead to different types of new design knowledge. Not only the artifacts themselves, but what I'll talk about in a little bit as design theory, which people have variously called design principles, guidance, uh, rules, um, but it's the, if you will, underlying theory of how we have performed the design itself. Any comments, questions so far? Okay, then from this uh, figure, we identified seven design research guidelines, which again, we don't mean to be uh, prescriptive here. We, we don't say that you, know, you have to have all seven of these to have a good design science research paper, but you need to think about them. You need, and let me go through them quickly. You need to have an artifact. Number one, what is your artifact? If you can't identify an artifact, what are you designing? Two, how is your problem relevant? That applies to all research, but in particular, what problem are you trying to solve here? And why is that problem important? Three, how did you evaluate? How did you provide evidence that your new design artifact is an improvement in the world? Four, your research contributions in both directions, into the real world, solving the problem itself at hand, but also contributing to the knowledge base so that people can then take that knowledge and move forward into further research here. Uh, how did you draw from the knowledge base to make sure your research was rigorous so that you aren't reinventing the wheel? Uh, and here we're talking about rigorous methods for both your build and your evaluate. Number six, probably the one that gets the most questions, and design is a search process. How did you search all the possibilities of the search space, if you will, to come up with the design you did. In most cases, there are probably infinite degrees of freedom to provide and build that design. How did you decide to do what you did for this project? Was it a you know, hill climbing search? I mean, there, was it a heuristic type of search? Uh, Herbert Simon, in his book, talks about satisficing where, you know, it's hard to define an equation to say, I've got an optimal design. When I see the word optimal in any design science research paper, that raises a big red flag for me. I mean, what do you mean by optimal? In most cases, as Herbert Simon would say, our designs are satisfactory. We satisfy, but we still demonstrate the improvement of that artifact. So how did you search? And finally, how did you communicate? How did you distribute this knowledge to the world? Questions? Okay, yeah. 
Uh, I won't say they're random, that we uh, sort of debated this uh, significantly, if you look at the paper, um, but it's sort of a logical flow here from you know, the things that are the most obvious to maybe the things that are not quite as obvious but still necessary. Of course, communication is obvious, but that's sort of the, the final, final piece of the puzzle. Okay? Uh, then to describe things, uh, I wrote a, a, a very short paper in the Scandinavian journal that uh, said well, you've really got three cycles in your uh, research here. The relevant cycle where you define what your requirements for, for the project are, but then taking that artifact back into the field. And if you find the artifact in the field needs more work, then you continue the cycle to the next uh, cycle of the research project. Same way with the rigor. You're drawing appropriately from your knowledge base, then you're adding to the knowledge base, and then the next cycle of your research grows the knowledge. And then, of course, the design cycle that I've already, uh, already talked about. So to be a good or uh, an effective design science researcher, you need to have experience in the, all three of those cycles. And we can talk about uh, traction and you know, how one cycle drives the other. I won't get into all that detail uh, today. But um, you know, I think you can see the, the symmetry here, if you will. Uh, I'm just going to move through so that very quickly. I've said that. So that was just a quick overview of the 2004 paper. And uh, you know, we've been very fortunate that it has sort of struck uh, you know, uh, uh, a synergy in the in the IS community as well as other communities. I'm always uh, very interested in seeing where this paper is referenced, and it's uh, it, it, it's a good feeling to see that it's being referenced in uh, education, in you know more the engineering fields, um, and it, it it sort of has struck a chord with a lot of people who want to justify doing design as research. Um, so, it's, it's very, very, very pleasing there. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, 2013 paper that uh, Shirley Greger and I did. Of course, Shirley is known for her uh, papers on theory, uh, a, a well-known paper in MISQ, I'm forgetting the year right now, but defined the, the types of theory that IS scholars use. So it appeared for a while there, after our paper was published, that there were two camps, if you will. There was the camp that said, we do design as a pragmatic uh, approach, and as long as the design works, we can demonstrate its effectiveness. Uh, we're sort of uh, maybe apathetic or uh, uh, indifferent to whether there's a design theory or whether it's making a contribution to theory. Of course, our journals uh, looked a little askance at that. They basically said, if you're not producing theory, you're not going to get published. <laughs> um, so Shirley and I got together and sort of said, how, is, how do we merge this type of thinking? And we felt that the key was knowledge. How is knowledge consumed, produced, and communicated? So what is the knowledge in design? Well, it's the artifact. And how do we appreciate the levels of artifact abstraction here? And when is different abstractions of the artifact appropriate? And we felt the idea of maturity of the problem and maturity of the solutions were important. So we're going to expand on that. So identifying appropriate ways of consuming and producing knowledge, understanding and positioning the knowledge contributions of your project, and then we gave a little uh, template for how to produce a good design science paper. So, again, we, we based our argument here on knowledge. And we drew some from uh, some fields, in particular there's some very interesting work in a field called economics of knowledge. Uh, uh, the leading sort of writer there is a fellow by the name of Jay Mulker. Uh, you'll see his book in just a second here. Uh, he's at Northwestern, and he's done some really interesting work on identifying knowledge growth uh, 
throughout the Industrial Revolution as well as uh, up to today. So he defines uh, two types of knowledge in the world, descriptive knowledge and prescriptive knowledge, where descriptive knowledge is our traditional scientific knowledge where we go out and observe phenomenon in the world, whether it's natural, artificial, or human. We observe, we classify, we measure, uh, we catalog, and then we try to make sense of it. And we make sense by understanding there are natural laws in the world, but there are also patterns that we can develop theories around patterns. And so then we come up with sort of natural laws, natural theories. The other type of knowledge is prescriptive knowledge. And this is where we as creative human beings solve problems. And how do we do that? Well, just basically the way I've described in terms of design science. So here are our three types of artifacts, constructs, which are, let me go into just a second. These are the basic sort of fundamental uh, concepts and symbols that we use to represent both the problem and the solution space that we want to uh, try to make a contribution in. Those are the constructs. Then the models take the constructs and build representations. We get semantic ideas, we get syntactic representations. The methods are the algorithms and the processes and the techniques then that manipulate and use artifacts in the world to produce and to accomplish activities. And then the instantiations themselves are the systems and the products that, uh, that we build. So we then add design theory to this, and I'm going to expand on that, what do we mean by uh, design theory, and how does design theory eventually move over into descriptive theory? Sure. Uh, yeah, if I understand you correctly, heuristic knowledge is knowledge that we're, is still unformed, if you will. We're still trying to understand. And yes, that is what I'd put right here. So bear with me and we'll get into that. So he, here I think is, is, if you will, the crux of, of the issue here. And that is we have artifacts, but these artifacts are at different levels of abstraction based upon how much knowledge we currently have in the world. So, let's start from the bottom up. If we have a fairly immature problem, something that we're just struggling with trying to understand, we want to build something to try to achieve something along the problem's lines. Do we want to make a partial solution, if you will? So we build instantiations, you know, whether it's software, whether it's just you know, some uh, basic models or methods of, of what we want to do, it's a situated implementation of the artifact in a particular context. Okay? We're solving a problem. People are using it. Okay? They like it. Uh, they can identify performance gains, quality gains, some type of improvement in their workplace or in their classroom. And so that can be a research contribution if there hasn't come anything come before that, if it's new to the world, in a sense. However, as we gain more experience, then we try to generalize to the second level, which we term nascent design theory, or knowledge as operational principles in architecture. So we're, try, we're starting to move these new ideas into a more general format so that we can apply it to more situations. Okay? So we're starting to build that, if you will, heuristic knowledge or nascent knowledge of why this artifact works the way it does and why it solves the problem more effectively than previous artifacts that we've used. Eventually, then, we can move it into well-developed design theory about embedded phenomenon. 
and we can talk about mid-range theories and even grand theories, okay? And there's been, you know, work in philosophy and things like that, uh, Merton, uh, other people who have talked about mid-range theory uh, up to more uh, general theory. So, we, how do we make a contribution to design science research? Well, the answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends on your problem that you're trying to solve. So let me get into that representation. So again, design theory as knowledge. Um, again, quoting from uh, Shirley's work uh, where she talks about, in particular, the idea of design and theory for design and action. Uh, let me not expand on that. We can go back to it. So here is our research project. We're doing a design science research project. We start with our application environment with some research questions, research opportunities and problems. We build a team with interdisciplinary strengths, uh, cognitive, social, creativity, reasoning, and if you will, collective intelligence and teamwork. And then we draw from existing descriptive knowledge. People have called this the kernel theories that we use to establish a foundation for our project. What does the world know that can support our building this design? Okay, so we inform, this is informing descriptive knowledge, and here is our prescriptive knowledge here, constructs, models, methods, instantiations, and design theory. So this is our starting point. Okay, now as we do our build and evaluate cycle, we're gonna be adding new prescriptive knowledge here. And eventually, we wanna build theory to contribute to the descriptive knowledge of the world too. Because as we put that artifact into play, then we want people to be studying why that artifact works the way it does and extending descriptive knowledge. Does that make sense? Do you see how the interplay between building artifacts and eventually putting that artifact into context and then studying the artifact in context, which helps us then do the next cycle of design. So we look something like that then. Now this is one of the challenging parts about good design science research is that it's never ending. <laughs> because as we build new and better artifacts and as we understand more about how those artifacts are used, then we can build even better artifacts. Okay. The other interesting thing, and I'll just throw this out, I'm going to mention it later, is when you put an artifact into context, you, you, we've defined the problem originally in a representation. We now put the artifact into play. We've changed the problem. We've changed the context. So now we have a new problem. So it's sort of like we're never solving the same problem twice. We're always solving a new problem as we move through these cycles. And by the way, that's what Jay Moker found when he looked at the economics of knowledge in the Industrial Revolution. He found that as you know, steam engines and uh, other new artifacts were put into play, it just sort of changed the entire context. We have a new context and we do the next cycle of innovation and design. So uh, again, in this, in this 2013 paper, our sort of key contribution here is to say, well, let's lo look at a little two by two matrix here based upon two dimensions. <clears throat> what is the maturity of the problem domain or the application domain? Is it something new or has it been around for a long while? And what are the maturity of possible solutions for that domain? Okay, and so we come up with a little two by two that looks like this. Now, the tricky thing here is that we run from high to low on both axes. <laughs> so get that in your mind. Uh, so at the bottom is the problem domain. That's the x-axis. The y-axis is the solution domain. So high maturity 
on the bottom, low maturity, which means it's new and interesting to us on the top scales. So if you start at the top, we've got a problem that's brand new to us, something that's new to the world, and we have really no solutions. There's nothing that we can draw from as kernel theory or as existing artifacts to possibly solve that problem. So we're in what we term the invention quadrant, where we need to invent new solutions for new problems. Okay, clearly that's a research field. <laughs> it's an ill-defined, poorly defined research field. It's a high-risk research field. Two quadrants that are not quite as high risk, improvement, where the application, we know the problem. It's been around for a while. Okay, we just don't have any good solutions for it. So we want to be creative and develop new solutions for problems that people face all the time. Okay, <clears throat> so we want to improve the world and we want to demonstrate that improvement. So this is a challenging research opportunity. A uh, lot of research and development, uh, you know, resources are devoted to that. Now, the other interesting challenging area is this one down here that uh, we term exaptation. Uh, that word comes from biology, by the way, uh, where certain uh, biological traits uh, are adapted to new purposes. And sort of the classic one there is the uh, use of feathers on birds for flight because originally in the uh, evolutionary cycle, feathers were for warmth uh, to keep the, the birds uh, warm. And over time, they evolved to uh, where they supported uh, flight also. So here we've got uh, a new problem, but we have some solutions from other domains that we, somebody is creative enough to say, well, hey, I have interdisciplinary uh, ability to say, here's a new solution or problem here, but here's a solution in another domain. Let's see if that works. Let's see if we can adapt it to solving that problem. So extend known solutions to new problems. Adapt, adopt solutions from other fields. So that's exaptation. A lot of research is exaptation. Uh, there's where your interdisciplinary teams come into play who have a broad base of knowledge that say, hey, let's take this idea of hive behavior or let's take these uh, other types of uh, biological, physical phenomenon and say, can we apply it to solutions in this field. <clears throat> Probably the biggest quadrant, of course, is this one right here. It's a known problem. We've got some interesting good solutions, uh, and we apply known solutions to known problems. Now, that may sound trivial, but it isn't, because this is where, if you will, professional consultants reside. This is where people who are very skilled at certain solution techniques solve real problems for companies. The key is it's not a research contribution. It doesn't extend the knowledge that we have in that field. So while it is good work and while we really want to study that as best practice, uh, it's a little more difficult to uh, justify it being published as new research. Any questions uh, on this quadrant? Okay, let me just quickly go through each of those quadrants. I've already done it a little bit, but invention, radical breakthroughs, a departure from accepted ways of thinking and doing. Um, these, again, are high-risk projects, but here's sort of the key point. In this type of environment, here's where just building something is a research contribution. Uh, and, you know, you could... Think about sending a paper to your top journal, and if you could justify the fact that, hey, this is a new problem, nobody has an existing solution for it, so I just built this algorithm, or I just built this system, or this technique of teaching, and let's get it published. You know, let's get it out there for people to use, and then extend. So the newness of the artifact, of course, makes this a, a tough one. We all know stories about people having, you know, colossally new ideas that were 
rejected <laughs> many times and sort of you know, sniffed at uh, until they became very well known and uh, successful, right? Okay, and it's hard really to you know, represent what your new contribution is in this type of environment. But we do have uh, cases of this, you know, the first uh, um, data mining algorithm published back in 93 Sigmod, uh, um, you know, really changed the world uh, as we think about it. It opened up the whole world of business intelligence. Uh, you could argue that uh, Scott Morton's thesis back in the 60s on decision support systems was really uh, you know, innovative and defined a new problem and came up with a solution for that problem. Uh, improvement is something that, uh, you know, there clearly a lot of research is improvement research where we start from a ground basis of knowledge and we extend that knowledge. So we, the goal here is to clearly ground, represent, and communicate you know, what your new idea is and to provide convincing evidence of that idea. Uh, here we would expect a little more generalization, a little higher level uh, type of artifact, a mid-range theory uh, or a uh, nascent type of theory uh, that allows that generalization. So a lot of exemplars here. I won't go through all of this, but you know, new data mining, new recommendation algorithms, uh, improved routing algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Exaptation. Here is where um, we cha are challenged to define the problem context, and we are then want to demonstrate how some algorithm, how some technique that currently exists in another field can be adapted and applied here. Again, it's important that we provide evidence to show why that artifact is an improvement in, the, uh, in this new uh, field. So you could argue I have made the case that I think uh, Ted Codd's work on relational uh, database is a uh, example of exaptation because he came out of relational mathematics and applied the ideas of relational mathematics to databases. Extremely successful. <clears throat> you could argue that a lot of the World Wide Web work is uh, exaptation. Uh, you know, how do you uh, sort of change the world with this new technique of, you know, internet and World Wide Web uh, thinking uh, to sort of change supply chains. Uh, you know, it really uh, changes the uh, a lot of techniques uh, and it adapts IT into new uh, unexplored types of areas of, uh, uh, of application. And then as I mentioned the routine uh, design. Oops, didn't mean to hit that. Okay. And you can see that uh, you know in some other fields like management, uh, Jon von Aiken uh, is a management professor uh, at Eindhoven. Um, he's done a lot of work in this area of identifying best practices, document them in, in case study work. Uh, so studies of best practices, empirical generalization of how the you know how these ideas are used. Uh, some of Davenport's work on. Uh, Business process reengineering could be considered good research in the area of routine design. Uh, I know you can't read this, but <laughs> as part of the paper, what we did, we went through uh, our top journal, MISQ, from I believe uh, 2009 to 2013, and identified uh, 11, maybe 13 papers. And we found most of them to be improvement research, three of them to be exaptation research, uh, no invention and no routine, as you would expect. Uh, the other thing that's in this paper, just to go through it uh, quickly, is a template for presenting good design science research. Uh, the, the key difference, of course, is uh, first of all making sure that your kernel theories out of descriptive knowledge are well identified so that people know, you know what you're drawing on, what you're basing your uh, search space on. And then having two sections, one on building, 
How did you uh, build the artifact itself? What method did you use to do that? Uh, so then you would describe the artifact. The challenge here, of course, is how do you represent the artifact? Um, uh, again, Herbert Simon has some great advice here. He basically says, representing the problem and representing the artifact is 90% of the research. So representation is very important, coming up with the right way to represent both the problem space and the solution space that you're dealing with. Evaluation. Need a good section on that. You gotta understand how you presented the evidence to show the improvement of your research. Um, back in the late 90s, there was a survey done in software engineering where they looked at, I think, several hundred software engineering papers and showed that only about 20% of them even attempted evaluation of what they were doing in software engineering. So that field, I think, has uh, identified their gap and they're doing a much better job of understanding what it means to do a rigorous evaluation. You can't just present an algorithm. You've got to show how that algorithm changes things with evidence. Then discussion and conclusions. And as part of the discussion, you'll notice here is, you know, what level of artifact am I presenting? Why am I doing it that way? And how will we eventually grow design theory to descriptive theory from this work? And then we uh, grabbed a paper that uh, actually Shirley was the SE for uh, and showed how it uh, was presented in exactly that template. So again, this slide is mostly for doctoral students, but <laughs> I'll show it to you. It says, how do you get published? Uh, and really, we have to draw a little bit from the engineering field here, because the, the pattern in engineering is getting your ideas out so that they can be refined very quickly in conferences and workshops. So I encourage students that you know, don't you know, start right away thinking, well, this paper is MISQ. You know, get it out, get, get some feedback. Um, you know, put it through that fire to refine it. Uh, in ACM, IEEE, AIS, INFORMS, a lot of different conferences here. Uh, Desrist is a conference that uh, I started with uh, Samir Chatterjee back in uh, 2006, specifically as a workshop to help uh, uh, understand how to present good design science research and refine it uh, for eventual journal publication. And so, you know, we are trying to uh, build a expertise in design science research in our major journals. Uh, I know other fields have done the same. I've actually had experience talking with accountants. They've tried to get, you know, accounting, design, science uh, uh, in their fields. Um, I had have, have little experience talking to some uh, people in the education field about design. So, you know, we are trying to understand how to best uh, get these ideas into uh, the top journals in all the fields. Okay, let me stop here because I'm sort of switching gears a little bit. Any questions so far? Is this all making sense? <laughs> And if it does make sense, you know, you got to get it, got to get it into the into the journal publications. Yeah. Uh, so it strikes me that a number of your examples would probably be the same in the computer science examples, like a computer system people, uh, SSA, or something like that. Is that right? And I'm wondering if there's something distinctive about the way you think about design science for IS versus what computer scientists would say they should do with the law or just computer systems in particular. Well. Since I have a foot in both fields, I mean, my PhD is in computer science. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, and, and in particular when I was at NSF, I dealt with, uh, you know, the computer science world also. Uh, and I would argue that we can, both of us can learn from the other in a lot of, uh, you know, this, these types of publications. Uh, I think the computer science or the engineering field can learn this whole idea of, uh, you know, rigor, uh, 
uh, understanding the, where the knowledge comes from, uh, grounding research better in terms of uh, rigor, as well as uh, evaluation and uh, developing uh, evidence that grows theory, if you will. But I think we can learn from the um, engineering and computer fields in ways I've mentioned just a little bit earlier, and that is getting the ideas out into conferences and you know, I know you open access types of journals so that you can get feedback much more quickly. I mean, trying to publish something where it takes four years to get something in print is not a world of design. <laughs> and I'm going to actually mention that tomorrow in my talk. Um, so, yes, I admit to being a little biased in coming out of the computer science world, but I think what these ideas can be applied to really any field you know, such as management, accounting, education, uh, whatever. You just have to have the experience to know how to present it, how to position it for your discipline. Okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, I don't claim to be an expert in grounded theory. So. <laughs> but uh, what I would take is that, you know, there are theories, there are kernel theories out there that we have to be aware of, we have to be knowledgeable of, and we've got to identify those grounded theories appropriately as a starting point for building a new piece of design, for building a new artifact. And if we don't, then we're going to be criticized and say, well, you know, you, you've based your design on some false assumptions or for some outdated assumptions. So you've got to get the theory right. And then the challenge, of course, at the end is to say, okay, how does my artifact now advance that theory? So, yeah, there's a definite relationship there. And it's important that we appropriate theory correctly, but it's also important that we contribute to that theory. You know, you, you're preaching to the choir here. Uh, yeah, I, you know, because when I present to doctoral consortiums, I say, you know, hey, s send me something. I'm, I'm happy to give you some feedback on it. And as an editor of MISQ, uh, I, I did a lot of that feedback type of work. In fact, I probably, you know, gave comments more on more papers than I edited. Um, yeah, you, you really have to point out what they're missing. In, in terms of design. And, um, you know, I really go back to the, the rigor, what we've just talked about is that, you know, yeah, you're, you're putting together an algorithm here, but you haven't identified the existing algorithms that are out there that are, if you will, competing, that you're competing against. And sometimes that's very difficult. I, I, I still remember one case where somebody came up with a new recommendation algorithm. and. I sent it out to a, a reviewer to get a friendly review, and he said, well, this, you know, this has been outdated by two years. Google's recommendation algorithm or somebody's recommendation algorithm you know, has by bypassed this. And I said, well, can you give him a site? And he goes, well, no, because it's a proprietary algorithm. <laughs> I, I, am, I just know that it exists, you know, and his isn't going to cut it. What can I do? I mean, I, you can't encourage somebody to publish an algorithm that is outdated. So, you know, that's just too bad. And, you know, until we lose some of this proprietary uh, nature, you know, people are going to know that or are not going to know that. The other thing is evaluation. Um, you know, people, like you say, they just throw an algorithm out there saying, you know, hey, my team loved this algorithm. It made them more productive. You know, publish my paper. Um, well, 
a single case study is difficult to get published in a top journal like that. Uh, so you have to have a little more rigorous way of identifying uh, the improvement. So it is a tough challenge. Uh, you know, doctoral students are uh, a little scared <laughs> of, of committing to this type of, of research. Um, but I argue that, you know, this is, this is what we're here for. We're here to solve problems. It's human nature. And if we don't in integrate a little bit of this type of thinking into any research project we do, we're sort of not doing what we're, we're here for, in my mind. That's a little pompous, but whatever. <laughs> Other comments? How we doing? Okay, um, let me go through one more paper with you, because um, this sort of moves it, moves it forward a little bit uh, with my um, fellow faculty member, Grandin Gill. Some of you know Grandin. Um, and we sort of said, how can we rethink the de dependent variable in, uh, in design science research? How can we make the results, uh, the artifacts, the design theories more sustainable? So we wrote this paper, um, and it appeared in ACM Transactions on MIS. Uh, to appear, it has appeared now. Uh, so let me give, sort of give you a quick idea here. Clearly, most people, when they evaluate artifacts, evaluate on utility, on, if you will, how, it, uh, how it's used, how effectively it's used. Um, and even some people use the perceptional TAM models to evaluate uh, uh, artifacts. We think that that's a little, you know, it, it works, but it, it isn't as effective as it should be. It isn't as, uh, uh, it doesn't get at what really is important with good design. And that is how sustainable is that design? Will that design adapt itself to new situations? Uh, sort of its reproducibility. So we drew from biology as well as economics, uh, the fitness ideas, the utility ideas, to come up with a way of better uh, understanding how to evaluate good design. Okay, this gets a little, uh, a little abstract, if you will, but we talk about fitness landscapes. Uh, we talk about the problem space that we're trying to solve, and we say that a design has a DNA. Uh, it has a set of characteristics that we can uh, represent and capture, and uh, what we would hope is that this uh, DNA sequence can demonstrate a fitness to the current environment, but also the ability to evolve and adapt to new environments or changing environments, if you will. So what we would like to sort of capture here is how do we characterize a design's DNA and then how do we demonstrate that it is a good design in terms of fitness and evolvability? So this is a little diagram that, uh, that we have where this is the fitness landscape where we have a whole set of possible designs and we try to uh, represent the important characteristics of that design. Then we have a problem where we take the design, we put it into the problem context here, where then we solve the problem, and then we try to understand. We try to appreciate and come up with the nascent theory of what is the evolvable characteristics that we want to encourage, and maybe what characteristics do we want to discourage uh, as we move forward here. So we want to talk about both fitness and um, sort of utility. Now there's two actual definitions of fitness uh, in the world, and that is um, its ability to survive at a high level of capacity. You know, so how do, much do we enjoy life? Uh, so there's a uh, aspect of uh, fitness as ability to uh, survive and do well. 
The second fit, uh, characteristic here is more of a biological fitness, and that is its ability to replicate and evolve over successive generations and adapt to new environments. And we know that uh, based upon you know, a lot of research uh, in the world that these two are not necessarily correlated. You know, high fitness civilizations sometimes do not uh, reproduce well uh, over time. Um, so how do we sort of get the best of both worlds? And in particular, we want to focus on definition two, is how do we get that design DNA to evolve over successive generations? Uh, bringing in a little bit of uh, economics here, um, what we want to characterize uh, a utility function based upon a set of characteristics of the design and we want to you know, come up with uh, a way of um, representing and calculating, you know, having a way uh, quantitatively to talk about goodness uh, of this design. And we've, you know, this has been done in the economic world uh, a lot. Uh, people talk about utility functions for, uh, you know, high functioning uh, human existence, that type of thing. But let's, uh, clearly we'd have a different utility function for the different problems we're facing, uh, the wicked problems. And there's a whole field. <coughs> Uh, of evolutionary economics. Uh, we won't get into it, but the key point here is that this field has identified things called ESSs, which are evolutionary stable strategies that encourage the traits that promote diversity and adaptation over uh, different uh, human evolution. And the other important point is, if you talk about human evolution, what, each generation is what, 20 years. ICT evolution, each generation is what? <laughs> Six months, <laughs> nine months, you know, at most maybe a year or two. So we have a lot more capability to study, uh, you know, reproduction and generation in a complex, continuously evolving uh, ICT fitness landscape. Okay, so as we apply this to our design science research ideas, um, we identify that artifacts really play two roles. They provide evidence that a particular design is feasible, has value, can be represented, and can be built. So this is sort of the survivability criteria that we want to capture uh, with an artifact. But an artifact also provides a mechanism for communicating between designers and understanding the problem better, and in fact, the problem evolves, as I said before, as we put the artifact into place. So it's almost like the Schrodinger pr principle, right? Is that as soon as you put, uh, shine a light or put an artifact into the environment, the environment changes, okay? And so all of a sudden we have to think about how we evolve uh, the utility fitness functions uh, for that artifact. So search on the design space changes the design space by modifying the utility function of what it means for a design to be fit. So we could reframe DSR in some interesting ways. So the goal is now to impact the design space to as to, so as to ensure a continuous flow of high fitness design artifacts through the production of artifacts that demonstrate the feasibility of new design and through improving the utility function that we use to assess the fitness of the artifact itself. So it's almost like recursive here. <laughs> We've got a recursive uh, issue in design. So that, and you know, it points out that Herbert Simon is right. You know, we're never gonna get optimal here because we can't optimize a changing fitness function because uh, it's always gonna be changing on us. Uh, let me just jump uh, to this slide. So what we argue in the paper is that there are several questions we have to ask ourselves when we do a design science research project. How do we measure, first of all, how do we find the fitness characteristics? How do we measure them? How do we select appropriate characteristics for the problem or the application environment? How do we combine and weigh those characteristics? I mean, what's more important than the other? 
And then how do we evolve this utility function over generations as the environment changes? So clearly most of our work has been sort of in this space right here, defining what does it mean to be useful? Uh, what does it mean to be effective? Uh, better performance, et cetera. Um, and we also identify the fact that, you know, based on Christensen's work, uh, some designs are so useful, we sort of can't deal with them. You know, basically they sell so well, you know, we can't, uh, we, we sort of have to, uh, it, it's what, the innovation uh, uh, paradigm or dilemma, if you will, uh, because we can't move to the next generation because our current generation is selling so well. What we would argue, and we, in the paper we just go through these very quickly, I think there's seven of them there, that we need to bring in some characteristics that are beyond usefulness, decomposability, malleability, openness, embeddedness, novelty, interesting, and elegance. You can imagine the challenge of how to define those, right? How do you measure them? How do you weigh them? I mean, is openness more important than novelty? Uh, is decomposability more important than interestingness? Uh, you know, you, they're not on the same scales, so it's a little hard to really understand that, why th this is a sort of a conceptual paper. <laughs> you know, we're not giving you any answers here. We're just saying this is the way we should be going. Question? Okay, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, is there a minimal threshold of novelty and interestingness? And I would argue, yes, probably there is. Um, but again, what is it? <laughs> I mean, we know that people would argue that, you know, the Apple <clears throat> iPhone and iPad and iPod sold because there was some element of elegance to it or, you know, sort of, uh, you know, but how do you measure that? You know, a lot of it might be perceptual, but, uh, you know, you'd like to be able to capture a little bit of quantitative uh, type of thinking there, too. So, again, uh, what we've done here, and uh, I just have a slide for each one of them. Um, again, here's the innovator's dilemma that Christensen talks about. If you're too useful, uh, you can't go to the next generation without major pain. Um, but decomposability, people in software engineering have talked about decomposability for many, many years. Uh, its importance, its ability to uh, provide independence uh, of modules. Malleability, uh, flexibility to change, uh, this is important. In fact, Shirley mentions this term in her theory, design theory work, is you know, how do you capture malleability? Uh, openness, clearly we know of some examples there, Unix versus Linux, uh, you know, how important is openness uh, to evolvability of your design. Uh, embeddedness, uh, this is a little bit controversial, uh, but if it is embedded in a particular development environment, it makes it much easier to, uh, to evolve uh, and to, to, to control, if you will. Novelty, uh, how do you define novelty? Uh, actually, Grandin uh, likes to define it in terms of if you're on a search space and you're at a local minimum, you know, novelty means that you're jumping to another, uh, I'm sorry, maximum. If you're at a local maximum on your search space and, uh, you know, anywhere you go, you're, you're going to go down, but now you've got to explore. You've got to jump to another part of your search space. And that's what he would define as novelty. Uh, interestingness, uh, surprises, unexpected behaviors, uh, but it also has a propensity to diffuse. Uh, there's a meaning to it that you can understand and help support your understanding of why that design is interesting as opposed to other designs. Elegance, like I said, you know, sometimes in the eye of the beholder, but, you know, people have tried to capture this with uh, compactness, simplicity, transparency, uh, clarity, uh, you know, that all goes toward the idea of elegance. 
And so, you know, we sort of pull some of these concepts together uh, and demonstrate what their impact would be on a effective, good design, uh, diversity, diffusion, longevity, uh, ability to modify effectively. So, you know, we do have an understanding of why these are important to us. It's capturing them in design that is a challenge. So there's a lot of pros here. I think, uh, you know, just intuitively, it makes a lot of sense to think about, you know, moving beyond just utility, um, where, you know, the researcher is a more active participant. It's a, a better understanding. You can communicate these ideas to uh, a large, large populace. But when you get down to the details, you've got some cons because it's really a, a different way of thinking about research. It's, it's hard now to provide definitive evidence for the quality and effectiveness of your design. Um, and as we say, existing research standards do not really reward this uh, because a lot of this is, needs some longitudinal uh, types of study. But bottom line, we really think uh, you know, this type of thinking is, is essential in our field because, you know, we're, we're having a hard time communicating our good ideas in sort of standard ways. We need maybe more in different ways here to uh, understand what a good design is. So, conclusions. Uh, we think we've got a, a new way of thinking here. We haven't really gone much further uh, on this piece of research. Um, but it, it's going to take some people getting into understanding case studies, and people are out there doing this sort of thing uh, of, you know, what is a good design? I know uh, Kali uh, Leitinen, um, uh, my good friend uh, Yongjin Yu, uh, some other people are, are thinking about uh, these ideas in terms of, uh, you know, what are good designs and how do we identify and present them in convincing ways. But I also think we have a lot to learn from other fields, such as evolutionary economics and how they've thought about, um, uh, you know, how to build these type of utility functions that include more than just profit and loss, <laughs> you know, that include uh, sustainable uh, activities to, for the environment, that, that type of thing. And that's what we're, you know, trying to parallel here in our thinking. Okay, uh, final couple slides just show where uh, colleagues and I have gone with some of these ideas. I'll be presenting this tomorrow in the conference, the thinking about how DSR applies to innovation. Uh, that's really a research in progress, so no definitive answers there quite yet. Uh, thinking about some neuroscience, the Gamunden uh, retreat. Uh, we're working on a couple projects there. Uh, in fact, I'm currently writing a paper for this year's uh, Gamunden. Uh, Cybersecurity, I've been working with a group in Sweden uh, to think about issues of uh, privacy and accountability uh, and how we can design some systems. <clears throat> uh, one of my doctoral students finished uh, about a, two years ago. Uh, we're thinking about organizational social networks and how we can come up with some good design principles for uh, getting people involved in, in social environments. And uh, a colleague from Germany, uh, Andreas Drexler, uh, spent six months with me and we're thinking about uh, ideas of socio-technical systems and DSR. Uh, we had a paper in Hicks this last year talking about the third R. We got rigor, we got relevance, but we also need uh, resonance. Uh, with uh, the stakeholder communities that we're trying to communicate with. Okay.